Okay, uh, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today's, or this afternoon's topic is the Austrian theory of the business cycle, which it, it turns out that it's a, a quite a timely uh, topic because there's a lot of uh, confusion among the powers that be about uh, what exactly a recession is. And I'm sure this has, has nothing to do with who's in office or who's in power right now. It's, it's purely an academic exercise. And so, so hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, Miss Yellen is uh, tuning in on the, the online viewing and she'll learn something from this uh, lecture. Uh, coincidentally, uh, somebody uh, yesterday, a good friend, uh, said that I looked like uh, Matt Walsh. And so perhaps uh, another uh, title for, uh, for uh, today's uh, lecture is, uh, what is a recession? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll clear it up. <clears throat> I usually put the recommended reading at the end, and I always run out of time. And since it's so important, I decided to bump it up to the beginning. So here's uh, just a few. You can uh, take a picture of this or, or find the slides online to, to see these. Uh, but these are just a few things that I would recommend that you read, it's sort of in order of uh, beginner to advanced. Uh, but uh, Meltdown by Tom Woods was really my first introduction to Austrian business cycle theory, and it's great. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to be talking about the theory. I'm not going to be talking about uh, historical episodes, except perhaps in passing. And so if you want a good uh, uh, example of how the theory is applied to historical examples of business cycles, then you could look at Meltdown or uh, America's Great Depression by Rothbard. I maintain that uh, the first couple chapters of America's Great Depression by Rothbard is still the best exposition uh, of Austrian business cycle theory. So uh, definitely check that out. Uh, there's also uh, The Causes of the Economic Crisis, which is a, a collection of essays and, and uh, talks by Ludwig von Mises, both before and after the, the big crisis that happened in, in the uh, late 20s and 30s. And so he didn't run into uh, Paul Krugman's problem of you know, having to backtrack and being incorrect about what he said. Mises has writings before and, and writings after, and we can see that it tells a coherent story. There's a, <clears throat> also a great article by Joseph Salerno in the, uh, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. It's called A Reformulation of Austrian Business Cycle Theory in Light of the Financial Crisis. And here he's responding to some misconceptions that he found in the literature and actually some Austrian adjacent scholars uh, that were, they were considering the, the Austrian theory as a sectoral shift or like a hydraulic sort of uh, mechanistic uh, theory. And so in this article, uh, Salerno sort of, he, he, he restates what the theory says and provides a good uh, definition of, of overconsumption and malinvestment and explains, explains how the theory does fit what we see in the data. Uh, in response to those critics. There's also A Time and Money, which is available in the uh, bookstore it's by Roger Garrison. Uh, it's, it's a great uh, uh, pedagogical exposition in which he's got uh, graphs that, that line up. And in the past, I've had those in, the, in my talk, but I've tried to change things up a little bit. So I don't have them here. But you can find Roger Garrison's previous lectures and also that book to see uh, the great graphs uh, that he has, and wonderful PowerPoints as well. With the, Nice sound effects. And then finally, uh, at the bottom, I have uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, his theory of money and credit, in which he originally expounded the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And it's worth noting here that uh, in, in this book, he is actually uh, connecting some, uh, some ideas that already existed about the, in the, the problems that exist with fractional reserve banking and how panics can, can arise. And in this book, uh, Mises shows how it's not just localized to the banking sector. It's not just something that's a, a trouble for, for finance and banks, but, it's, but when interest rates are falsified, when they're pushed artificially low, it's something that applies to production in general. And so that's, this is where we have the first, uh, the first telling of the, the Austrian business cycle uh, story. So <clears throat> another uh, interesting thing that we should point out here is that we're branching away from the unhampered market economy, or the theory of unhampered markets, and into hampered markets. So we've seen in the lectures so far this week that individuals on their own and individuals interacting in the market economy are able to economize. They're able to dedicate resources towards their highest value use. Uh, we've seen uh, lots of examples from Crusoe. So uh, Crusoe is able to uh, see the, the stuff that he has on his island by himself, and he's, he's able to with his own ideas and his own preferences, he's able to allocate those resources towards productive uses so that, so that he can attain the, the different uh, wants and needs that he has. 
And it's not really an intellectual problem. It's, it is difficult for Crusoe to go about that because he's operating in isolation as opposed to in a division of labor. But, but intellectually, it's not difficult because it's his own preferences, it's his own ideas, it's his own know-how that, that's being used to, uh, to arrange his environment in such a way to produce the things that he wants and needs. It's a little bit more difficult when we talk about a division of labor because then we have, uh, intellectually, it's, it's, there's an extra complication. And the complication is because it comes from the fact that we can't engage in uh, interpersonal utility comparisons. So your, your subjective value is your subjective value and mine is my own. So since these are all personal, there's no way for us to, to measure value in an, in an objective way. It be, we had this question, okay, so because of that, or since we have that, how do we allocate resources? Who gets to consume what? Who, who decides to produce what? And we've seen over the past day and a half, we've seen how we accomplish that in an unhampered market economy, namely through the use of market prices and profit and loss calculations. So economic calculation allows us to, for it, through voluntary exchanges on the market, we know that goods are being used towards their highest value use. So that's, that's how we, we branch from the individual acting in isolation to society. And there's, while there is that extra complication with the, the interpersonal utility comparisons, there's, we've seen how there's a solution to that, just voluntary exchange, private property uh, prices and, and profit and loss. But the question is, what happens when something outside the market acts upon market actors? What happens when somebody forces somebody to do something else? So instead of having voluntary exchange, we have uh, violent interactions or we have something like a state prohibiting people from, from doing the things that they would do if they were unhampered or if they, if they didn't have that sort of influence. And so that's where the Austrian business cycle theory fits. And it, that's worth stressing because uh, there are a lot of people who, who might say that business cycles just happen on, on the market on their own. So like capitalism is just prone to these inconsistencies. And so we, we have business cycles that just occur because of the instability of investment spending or, or animal spirits or all sorts of things uh, that are built into, the, it, built into the economy. But the Austrian theory says that no, there, there is no reason why we would expect that in an unhampered market economy. It only comes from outside the market. The only influences from outside the market would cause there to be the, the intertemporal discoordination that we see in the business cycle. So uh, one example that I have going back to, to Crusoe is um, Crusoe has a, a certain a stock of consumer goods that he's collected over time. He's, he's saved up some, some of his resources. He hasn't consumed everything. And that allows him to engage in a prolonged period of production. If, if he has extra coconuts and berries and fish or whatever it is, if he has more of those things, then he can spend the day making a capital good. He can, he can spend the week, perhaps, depending on the size of his subsistence fund, depending on, this, on the amount of coconuts and berries that he has. He could, he could dedicate some time to different lines of production that have payoffs in the future. He can make specific capital goods today as opposed to just going out and collecting coconuts and berries like he does in normal times. So this, this uh, stock of saved resources allows him to engage in uh, longer production projects, right? However, suppose uh, uh, in, in his collection one day, he, he finds some uh, mushrooms that are growing and he consumes some of these mushrooms. And these are not the good mushrooms, but the bad mushrooms. And they cause him to hallucinate. And the, the precise nature of these hallucinations is that it causes him to, to see his, his stockpile of saved resources, and instead of it being its actual size, it's 100 times bigger, or 1,000 times bigger, just like this gigantic pile of coconuts and berries. You know, Crusoe is a millionaire in his own respect, right? So what, what we can ask then is, okay, how would Crusoe change his actions with this misguided, this, uh, this incorrect view of his his savings? And the answer is he would engage in totally different, much longer lines of production than he otherwise would have. Instead of, instead of going out and building a, a raft, perhaps, he might look at his massive pile, remember it's false, it's a hallucination, look at this massive pile of saved resources and start building a mansion instead. Or instead of a, a fishing pole, he might uh, build this massive, uh, start building this massive boat that he could you know, either take back to the division of labor or use for fishing. But the, the point is, his view, his, his own perception of the, the stockpile of saved resources determines the sorts of production projects that he would undertake, right? 
And so this is the same sort of thing that happens in, in the business cycle in a division of labor. There's something that happens to the, to the, the supply of money and also to uh, incomes and the interest rate that make it appear as if we, everybody, the entire economy has more resources set aside for production or would allow us to pursue longer lines of production than currently exists. So there's a falsification of that perception. And that comes from outside of the market, either through central banking or through uh, 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 fractional reserve banking. When there's an increase in the, the supply of money that, that comes from somewhere besides you know, going into the, into the ground and mining some gold. Okay, so uh, Mises has a, a more straightforward analogy that uh, doesn't involve any hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, so this is a great analogy, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful one. Uh, so let me just uh, read through it. Mises says, the whole entrepreneurial class is, as it were, in the position of a master builder whose task it is to erect a building out of a limited supply of building materials. If this man overestimates the quantity of the available supply, he drafts a plan for the execution of which the means at his disposal are not sufficient. He oversizes the groundwork and the foundations and only discovers later in the progress of the construction that he lacks the material needed for the completion of the structure. It is obvious that our master builder's fault was not an overinvestment, but an inappropriate employment of the means at his disposal. So there's this master builder who has an incorrect view of the resources that he has to complete the structure. And as a result, he starts building the wrong kind of house. He, he builds, he, he lays a foundation that's for a, a house that would be much bigger than what would be appropriate for the amount of resources that he actually has. And so Mises makes this connection. It's, it's a good analogy because it works both as an analogy for what the what entrepreneurs and what the economy experiences in a boom-bust cycle, but also in a literal sense, we actually see in some boom-bust cycles, we uh, whole neighborhoods are built that are based on this plan that's much bigger than can actually be uh, completed. We saw this in the, uh, the 07 and, and 08 uh, recession, where it's like we look back in the past and say, like, oh, wow, we, were, we planned to build this house, but we can't. It's, we can't finish it. It's, it's not profitable for us to do so. So that's why I think it's a, it's a great little story. Okay, so let's uh, uh, define a business cycle by first ruling out what business cycles are not. In uh, America's Great Depression by Rothbard, he, he's very clear about this, that business cycles do not refer to regular, everyday industry or firm-specific fluctuations. So there are business fluctuations that happen all of the time due to changes in the market data including uh, consumer preferences, including our ideas about technology that we can use to produce different things, uh, and the sheer amount of consumption and time preferences and the resources that we have at our disposal. These sorts of things are changing all of the time, and we've already seen that it's the task of the entrepreneurs, in a great lecture by uh, uh, Dr. Klein, that it's the task of entrepreneurs to, to bear these, the uncertainty associated with these changes. So we're not sure what the future will hold. Entrepreneurs are tasked with, the, with this responsibility. So they're the ones who are putting resources on the line to try to make things that, that consumers want in the future. This, this sort of change, the, the changes that happen in the market like this are, we, we already have a theory, we already have this, uh, we, we understand the mechanics of this. There's, this is not a business cycle because what we, what we see uh, on top of these sorts of changes is we see that there are general booms and general busts. And I just have a few graphs there. It's not quite as important for you to, to know like what is being, like what these graphs are of, but just see the shapes of the lines. There's a stock market index in the top left. Uh, the unemployment rate is in the top right. Uh, gross output uh, is in the bottom left. And then the uh, Case-Shiller home price index is in the bottom right. But you'll notice the key feature of all these is that there's these big ups and downs. And these are things that apply to the economy as a whole. This is not a specific business fluctuation. This is not a change in consumer demand that an entrepreneur is trying to, to anticipate and then they change their production accordingly. This is something that's happening to the entire economy, it seems. It, it might be that some industries are affected more than others, but nevertheless, it's something that applies to in general. So it's a general boom and, and then a general bust. So that, that's what we mean by a business cycle. And that's what our business cycle theory should explain. <clears throat> Another thing that we notice in uh, business cycles is that uh, 
we notice that consumer prices don't fluctuate as much as factor prices. So that's another thing that we need to take into account. Rothbard notes that capital goods industries fluctuate more widely than do the consumer goods industries. And we see a consumer price index on the left and the producer price index on the right. And you see that just using uh, some eyeball metrics as opposed to econometrics. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So to do a little bit of stock taking, our theory needs to account for these things. We have to account for the shape and the stages of the, of the cycle. We have a boom followed by a bust, and it's, it's general. It's for the whole economy. We have to uh, take into uh, account the cluster of entrepreneurial errors, or at least explain what, what might be causing those errors to uh, arise or to happen. And uh, we also need to account for the more dramatic fluctuations in capital goods industries compared to consumer goods industries. And since this is something that happens to the economy as a whole, we, have, we immediately have a couple suspects. And that would be in money and in credit for a couple reasons. Uh, one is that uh, money and credit pervade the entire economy. So in a money using economy, one half of all transactions has money on it. So if there's something that's Affecting the entire economy would make sense to look at money since it's everywhere. And we might also be interested in looking at credit since it's, it uh, has such a big role in, in uh, entrepreneurial decision making. The, the supply of credit allowing entrepreneurs to, to borrow and then undertake production projects for, for long periods of time. So that, those will be our suspect areas. Okay, so now that we have the, the groundwork and a definition, here's the outline for the rest of the of the lecture here. So first we'll recap the structure of production. We had a great uh, lecture by Professor Rittenauer on that, but I'll, we'll just recap it so, since it's such an important part of this story. And we'll also recap time preference and interest. Once again, another great lecture by Professor Herbener. Uh, and we'll see how that the, the unhippered market economy is, is integrated and coordinated along both of these dimensions or in both of these areas. So we have the Production is structured in a certain way in stages, and then there's the time preference that we all have and the resulting social rate of time preference of the, or the, the interest rate that emerges that allows us to allocate uh, resources across time. And so we'll see how those work together. Uh, and when we see how those work together, we'll see what is required for us to have sustainable economic growth. What, understanding that production happens for certain reasons, uh, what, what does it take for us to produce more? What does it take for us to have more consumer wants and needs uh, satisfied? So, that, so we'll come up with a theory of sustainable growth. And then we'll ask the question, what could cause this to, to, to be messed up? What could cause this to be unsustainable as opposed to sustainable? Since we see that there's this boom that's inevitably followed by a bust, what happens in those sorts of booms that's not sustainable? And we'll see that the answer, the key to the story, comes from overconsumption and malinvestment. So first, to recap the structure of production, instead of flourless chocolate cake, I have bread that probably has flour in it, and, and uh, it's being used to make a sandwich. And so this is following Rothbard. He uses this example. And uh, usually when I'm teaching this in class, we'll have some back and forth. But for the sake of time, I'll, I'll do all of the work for you. So if we, if we ask, uh, what does it take to, to produce a ham sandwich, and we set it up in this way, where we just put the consumer good in the middle, and then we start putting the factors of production that are required to make the ham sandwich around it, we might have something that looks like this. So we need ham, we need bread, lettuce, some condiments, a plate, a table and chair to eat the, the ham sandwich at, if this is at a deli. And uh, we also need uh, uh, some space, so like some physical space that we would occupy to put the ham sandwich together and then consume it at the, at the table. Once again, this is a deli. And we also need some labor. We need somebody to put all of these ingredients together at the deli. And as we all know from the uh, previous lecture, this is not our stopping point because we just have, we can ask this same question again. So where, if we're asking where does the ham sandwich come from, we would also need to ask where does the ham come from? Where does the lettuce come from, the bread, and all these other ingredients? We don't need to do that for land and labor since those are originary factors of production. So they don't; those are uh, provided to us uh, just by God. Like we just have physical space available to us and the ability for us to to use human effort to in in production. So there's not an, there's not an explanation behind that. They're originary. But when we do that, we see that there's a there's another ring around the rosy here. So the butcher comes from from are the 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 ham comes from the butcher. The butcher needs some land and labor and uh, other capital goods as well. The bakery has land, labor, 
oven and flour. The flour comes from farming. I skipped a few steps there, as you'll see. And th this just becomes a completely complicated mess. It's a very complex uh, structure of production. And eventually, if we were like, <laughs> if we wanted to be thorough with this, it would end up looking something like this. It's extremely complex. And so what Austrians have done is that they, they've come up with two ways to simplify this so that we can actually work with it because it's pretty impossible to work with this, right? In, in a way, like you would move a, a demand curve on a supply and demand graph. So the way that we've organized it is by putting these different, these nodes, the, the things that are happening in production, it, we put them in time. So we put the stuff that happens first on the left and then the stuff that happens last on the right. Or uh, in some authors, they do higher to lower, so top to bottom. But the idea is this. We just shuffle everything around so we have the or original starting factors of production on the left, and then we end with the consumer good on the right. This is still a little bit uh, difficult to work with, but uh, I would call your attention that this is very similar to uh, Rothbard's figure 32 in Man, Economy, and State. If you turn your head to the side a little bit, you'll see that this is just land and labor being used to make capital goods through a structured production that ends with a, a consumer good at the end. <clears throat> still a little bit intractable, so instead of having these nodes in a web form, we stack up the spending on all of the things that, that happen in those stages. So at the earliest stage of production, there's an amount of spending on all of those factors. Then there's another stage of production. We can tally up the spending on all those, on all those things. So we've organized that giant complex structure of production just for a ham sandwich. And we've, we've organized it by time on the horizontal dimension and then by spending on, in the vertical dimension. And, and what we have is a nice tractable structure of production as a result. Now, uh, we, you, you might have heard the evenly rotating economy mentioned in a couple of the lectures. The evenly rotating economy uh, is uh, it's a thought uh, experiment, it's a construct, that, imaginary construct that we use to, to say what would happen if there's no more uncertainty? What happens if, if the, the market day repeats itself over and over, or whatever the market period is, if it repeats itself over and over again, such that there's no more uncertainty about what happens in the future? And one, one thing that we know is that all profits would, would go to zero. There'd be no more profits since entrepreneurs, are, the, the source of profits is correctly guessing over and above what other people anticipate about the future, correctly guessing consumer demands for different goods. And so if you, if you make everybody a perfect guesser by eliminating uncertainty, uh, there's no more profit. However, an important conclusion from uh, Mises and Rothbard is that there is still a spread between stages, and, and that's due to time preference. So since capitalists and entrepreneurs are being asked to part with present consumption by purchasing these factors of production earlier in the, in the stages, and they only get the revenue until later, it means that they have to reckon their own time preferences as a result. And we've, we've also seen from, from uh, Professor Herpener's talk that uh, there, there's some uniformity that happens, that because of arbitrage opportunities, uh, the, the rate of interest that occurs in one line of production is the same that would, that would apply to a, a different line of production and also between the uh, credit markets and also in production as well. So there's this uniformity that happens. So the only remaining spread between the stages of production is just interest. And in fact, this is the, this is the more important, as, as Rothbard notes, the more important time market. It's the, the market for factors of production uh, it's, it's, more, it's bigger and more widespread as compared to a loanable funds market or a credit market where we also see interest emerge. So this, the, the fact that we have uh, trades of present money for future money occurs because we have varying rates of time preference. Uh, and so once again, time preference is it's based on the fact that we have this disutility in, in waiting. Uh, I, I like to uh, explain it in this way. So uh, Mises said that all action is aimed at removing felt uneasiness. So all action, just universally, this is not something that we just uh, notice as an imperial regularity. For action to be action, it means that there has to be this dissatisfaction with the current state of affairs. And so when, when we uh, elongate the amount of time between starting an action and actually getting the payoff, getting the, the consumer good or the satisfaction, the desired state of affairs, it means that we're increasing the amount of time that we're experiencing that <clears throat> that uneasiness that Mises talked about, or, or 
extending that amount of time that we had that dissatisfaction with, with the present state of affairs. And so that's why it's a, it's a praxeological thing and not just a, um, a psychological or empirical thing. Um, so even though we all have time preference, there is a variety of rates, which means that we can trade. And I've got an example uh, between uh, David and Jeff here where they have, they have a double inequality of value for, diff for different amounts of money in different time periods, as opposed to like apples and oranges, they're trading money, but in different time periods, present and future. So we have a, an interest rate, and as we mentioned before, this, this interest rate is the same one that would apply in production. And we would see it as the slope of that triangle shape, the Hayekian triangle, um, in the evenly rotating economy. Okay, so to put all of that together, so we have the structure of production, time preference and interest, uh, we, we have intertemporal coordination. So we have consumers, uh, that have certain uh, time preferences, and entrepreneurs' plans are limited by this. They're limited by the, the set of resources that have been not consumed. Like, so there's some resources that are consumed in any given time period and some that are set aside for investment and production. And so that's a limiting factor for entrepreneurs. They can only pursue the, the lines of production that are, that are enabled by the resources at their disposal. And while, so I'm saying it in this way, but all of that happens through credit markets and through the, the structured production and the rates of return that happen between stages. But it's the same sort of thing that uh, would apply to Crusoe when he's deciding what lines of production am I going to pursue? Am I gonna pursue really long ones? Do I have a large stockpile of coconuts and berries that would enable me to, to make more capital goods and pursue X, Y, and Z? Or do I have a smaller set of saved resources that would only allow me to produce you know, A, B, and C, right? So it's the same sort of thing happening socially in this regard. It's just all happening through, once again, market prices, profit, and loss. Okay, <clears throat> so the only projects that are deemed profitable are the ones in which the discounted, anticipated discounted revenues uh, from the sale of output exceed the cost of production. So there's this limiting factor. Entrepreneurs can only start lines of production that meet that threshold. And the threshold is, is uh, determined at least in part by time preferences because we have to discount those revenues in the future to make a comparison to the cost of production today. <clears throat> so entrepreneurs uh, do not undertake projects that would take too long. And I know that's not a very precise you know, uh, term there. So if we define too long as uh, there's insufficient, insufficient resources to complete them, or perhaps there's, there are more urgently desired projects. So uh, an example here might be like, suppose Crusoe makes a, a mistake in which uh, he, he decides to, to start producing a, oh, I don't know, a, a, a toaster instead of a fishing net. And so the, the creation of the toaster to make to make toast, that requires a lot of other effort and the payoff there would be much further down the road as opposed to if he could make a net that would allow him to catch fish tomorrow, perhaps. So he, he could make a mistake that's not just based on the, the set of available resources, but it's also just a mistake based on what is, what is more urgent, what, what do I desire when? And as we've seen, the rate of interest is uniform across lines of production and across or between uh, consumption and production. Okay, so we see this uh, intertemporal coordination, but now we need to ask the question, uh, based, based on our outline, is how do we get sustainable growth? How, do, how does our economy grow in a way that doesn't have this inevitable bust? And the answer is with saving. So we actually have to bolster our savings first. We have to set aside resources away from consumption and toward production so that we can uh, produce more. So saving involves freeing up resources for production. Uh, in credit markets, we see this by uh, saved funds are, are made available to entrepreneurs, and they these entrepreneurs, with the lower interest rate and the and the, the availability of, uh, availability of funds itself, they're able to purchase additional factors of production and pursue new, longer, different lines of production. So, and that those new, longer lines of production would be in line with consumers' time preferences, because you remember we started off the scenario with consumers decided to save more. So we have an increase in savings, and entrepreneurs are responding accordingly. There is, there is a coordination there. 
And the, the initial investment, if it's in excess of what's required to just maintain and replace the existing capital stock, uh, this would pay off in the future with an expanded set of resources. So if we create new capital goods, if we bolster production, if we consume less today and, and add to our productive capabilities, it means that in the future we have more stuff, more goods and services, both more capital goods and more consumer goods, right? Because we've increased production today. But the important point is that this comes at a cost, right? You have to forego some consumption. You have to not consume some stuff so that those resources can be used in production. That's the important point. And there's, there's no way around it, right? It's, there's not a way for us to just increase production and increase consumption, right, with a given set of resources, right? We're just stuck with that. So, so that's, that's our explanation of sustainable economic growth. The way we get sustainable economic growth is by saving first. Okay, so next question is, what if instead of saving money, what, instead of saving more, what if that increased supply of loanable funds comes from the printing presses, where we just have brand new money is entering the scene and it's coming in through credit markets. It's not coming from people deciding to, to, to consume less and then those resources can be used in production. But what if it comes from something outside the market? perhaps a central bank increasing the money supply frantically. And so here, instead of, instead of calling this scenario an increase in savings, since it's, it's falsified, we'll call this an artificial credit expansion. So in this, in this case, newly created money enters the economy through credit markets, and it represents an increased supply of loanable funds. But one important point is we're going to say that time preferences don't change. So the consumer time preferences and, and like what would have happened on the market is, is, is just the same. And so this is just a, a new drop of, of, of money that's coming in through credit markets, but people's time preferences haven't changed. All right, so what are the effects of this? Well, this would decrease the interest rate, so it's increasing the supply of loanable funds, and so the interest rate comes down, the, the market price in the loanable funds market, and it's not because of a change in time preference. And at the lower interest rate, and also be just because incomes can increase now that there's an expan expanded money supply. So we have inflation, there's new money. So incomes increase and the interest rate falls. And so this enables uh, or encourages consumers to save less and to, and to consume more. So in, we actually have the opposite occurring. In real terms, we don't have an increase in savings. We have a decrease in savings as a result of this money pouring forth on the, on the credit market. So consumption and borrowing increase, and firms take the new funds, entrepreneurs take the new funds and invest in new longer lines of production. From the entrepreneur's perspective, this looks like, hey, now the, uh, the projects that I thought would not be profitable, they now appear profitable. It's the same as the, the, the mushrooms in Crusoe's case. It, from their perspective, they see the interest rate is lower, we can borrow now, uh, at, at a rate that would, that would allow us to deem this project that was, uh, it was off limits, now it is uh, within our feasible set of like profitable lines of production. So like now we can pursue this line of production that we couldn't before. <clears throat> As a result of this, factor prices increase. So entrepreneurs' demands for factors of production increase in the early stages of production. So, so now these they create new capital goods and they increase their demand for labor in the early stages of production, which means that factor prices uh, increase. Wages increase, employment increases, uh, consumption increases, and investment spending increases. Uh, not only do we have this you know, boost in, in business in the early stages of production, but we also have a boom in the later stages at the retail end because of the increased consumption. So both at, in, at the retail end, but also in the earliest stages, there's this boom that happens. And as a result, it looks like the economy is doing great. It looks like we just have uh, profits are abounding, incomes are up, wages are up, employment is up, stock prices are up. It's, it's just a wonderful time, right? As we know, this can't last, however, because this is, we're now in the unsustainable portion of the lecture. Okay, so uh, we have this boom that's general. It's not in just one sector. It's not just in one industry, but it's for the entire economy. So the key here, what prevents the, uh, this boom from going on forever 
is we do have a real resource constraint. We, we only have a certain number of resources. The projects that were started cannot be completed. Um, at some point, uh, Caruso, in his, in his hallucinations, he would realize, or the master builder in Mises' case, they would realize, I don't have the resources that are required to finish the projects that I had started. Like, it, it just can't happen. And this would, uh, this would appear in a, in a few different ways. One way is that uh, the prices of, of capital goods uh, might increase as, as we see the increasing scarcity of capital goods. Uh, we might see the interest rate shoot up or, or that might happen first in which the projects that were ex we, we expected to be able to do based on easy credit, now it's not possible for us to do that because interest rates are increasing. Uh, but th the point is that we have overconsumption and malinvestment. So overconsumption is the, it's the fact that the new profits and incomes and higher net worth calculations and the lower interest rate, all of those combined encourage increased consumption, more consumption than what would have happened absent the, the artificial uh, credit. So resources move from early, so real resources, not just spending, but real resources move from the early to the late stages due to that uh, increased consumption. And this is uh, something that uh, Salerno highlights in his uh, article um, in the QJ that I mentioned at the beginning. And we also have malinvestment. And malinvestment is the fact that uh, resources are misallocated. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not like it's like, oh, we, we move resources from, from these lines to these lines, but let's just finish it out. It's like, no, it's, it's a misallocation because it's not, it wasn't based on available resources. It wasn't based on consumers' time preferences. These projects have to just have to physically have to be abandoned, both financially and physically. It's like, this is not going to pan out. And so uh, the inflation and the artificially low interest rates encourage that misallocation. And it's, uh, it's especially difficult in capital goods industries, as we mentioned at the beginning, one of the things that our theory has to explain is the, the greater fluctuation in capital goods industries. And the reason why is because specific capital goods are created during the boom. Specific meaning they're especially suited for one particular line of production. As opposed to labor, which is relatively nonspecific, it's, it's easier for us to find new profitable employment for, for labor as opposed to the, the, uh, the capital goods that were uh, created in the boom. So in sum, the credit expansion does not represent an increase in real resources available for consumption or investment. And I, th I think we've covered all of these points here. The projects just have to be abandoned because the resources aren't, aren't there. So what happens in the bust? What happens in the recession? Uh, we see firms liquidating the malinvested capital. Uh, wages decrease as these projects are abandoned. Uh, workers are laid off. Uh, but due to the, like I said, the relative non-specificity of labor, this is a little bit easier than, than the, the capital goods, which see a severe drop in their value. Credit markets dry up, so there's more uncertainty. We, we could have what's called a, a secondary deflation that's based on the, the as a Salerno calls it in his article, an entrepreneurial malaise that occurs because there's all this extra uncertainty due to capital values dropping and the recession and all the unemployment. So we might see this reluctance for lending to, to pick back up as a result. And we also see prices readjusting to reflect consumer demands. It's important to point out that the bust is a correction phase. So here it's like a recovery. It's like we're fixing the mistakes. So the mistake was we allocated resources to very long lines of production and we have to move those resources into new lines of production that actually will pan out. So, and that's what happens in the recession. It's a, it's a healthy period, even though it's painful. It's, it's just one of those things. Like, it, it hurts, you yeah, have to see wages decrease. It, these, these sorts of things are painful to see your, um, perhaps your retirement account decreases in value because the stock market is tanking. But the point is that from a bird's eye view, this is, this is healthy. This is what the economy needs to do as a result of all of the mistakes of the past. The reason I, I point that out is because a lot of the uh, government response to recessions and the bust that happens is, is to worsen or to, uh, to hamper this, this recovery phase. So they'll try to prop up wages. They'll try to increase government spending. They'll even increase the money supply once again uh, to try to maintain total expenditures, for example. Uh, and, but from the Austrian view, we'll see that this this actually hurts the recovery process, and you're actually just paving the way for another bust in the future. 
So uh, I have a, just a little bit of time. I thought I would uh, contrast it to some, some popular views. So there's the, the Keynesian view, and it's totally different. Like almost like it's almost like a complete opposite of the story that I just uh, told you. In the Keynesian view, busts come out of nowhere, usually from this, this uh, hard to describe uh, instability in investment spending. So like there are these, these uh, capitalists that they're operating on whims. They have these animal spirits that are, are either optimistic or pessimistic. And so they just all of a sudden people just get pessimistic and they, they pull their, their uh, funds out of the market. And so we investment spending tanks and, and since investment spending, as you'll see, is a component of total expenditure there, total, total income, it means that total expenditures falls. And according to the Keynesian view, while wages, there, there would be a decreased demand for labor, but wages don't come down for whatever reason. There's, we just have sticky wages. And so markets don't clear in labor markets. We have persistent unemployment. And so we have this, this doubling down effect where, or a spiraling downward effect where this one decrease in investment spending turns into another decrease in spending because of the uncertainty and the extra waning uh, animal spirits as a result. And there's nothing within the market economy that can fix it in the Keynesian view. So the only hope here, I told you this is totally the opposite, the only hope is government. The only thing that can step in and increase the total expenditures is government spending. And they would, and modern Keynesians would say that we could also use the central bank to increase the money supply that would all, also stimulate additional expenditure. But this is the only thing that we can do to get us back to that full employment uh, level of expenditure. Um, and what's interesting is that the Keynesians and the monetists are viewed as you know, opposing schools of thought sometimes. But you'll notice that the, when we contrast to the monetarist view, it's exactly the same, right? It's like the story is almost the same. Instead of there being this sudden decrease in investment spending, we have this sudden decrease in, in the money supply or in the growth rate of the money supply, depending on who you ask. And this causes total expenditures to fall, sticky wages prevent labor markets from clearing, and we have a, we have a crash. And the only hope in this view is we need, we need the central bank or some sort of monetary authority to increase the money supply so that we can get back to the full employment level of expenditures. And so they're, instead of the Y is equal to C plus I plus G, they're using this equation of exchange to, to help them tell that story. It's interesting because both Milton Friedman and Rothbard would blame the Federal Reserve it for, for causing the, the Great Depression, right? Or at least the, that boom bust cycle. They both pin the, the blame on the central bank in that case, but for totally opposite reasons. If you ask Rothbard, it was based on the, the growth in, in credit through the, the mid to late 20s that caused the, the Great Depression, or the, the crash that led to the recession and then the depression. And if you ask Milton Freeman, he would say, yeah, the Federal Reserve is at fault because they did not increase the money supply, right? So they didn't increase the money supply when they should have. They, they, they should have seen that all these banks were falling and they should have maintained uh, the money supply by being a lender of last resort and, and just increasing M. So notice they're both blaming the Fed, but for totally opposite reasons. In fact, if you compare monetarism and Keynesianism, there's a lot of similarities there. So in conclusion here, <clears throat> If you look at the highly aggregated data, if you're not looking at the stages of production and the intertemporal coordination that happens with time preference and interest in production, then you will misdiagnose the problem. If you're looking at total expenditures or just changes in the money supply, for example, you'll misdiagnose the problem and you will also give bad solutions. Uh, another thing that we've noticed in the process is that we had to first come up with a theory of sustainable economic growth. So how does our economy grow in a sustainable way. And this is, uh, goes back to Hayek's maxim. Um, it goes like this, before we can meaningfully ask what might go wrong, we should first understand how things could ever go right. And so we see how economies can grow if we have an increase in savings and, and we have the uns unsustainable growth if it's triggered by false savings or, or fake credit uh, emerging in, in credit markets. And so in conclusion, Sustainable growth is based on a real reallocation of resources away from consumption and towards production. So we have to have real savings. And unsustainable booms are caused by artificial increases in credit. And the recessions are the time in which we fix the mistakes that we made during that, that uh, unsustainable boom in the past. Thank you.